We're so glad that you found this Peak City message today. Our prayer is that during our time together, you're able to discover Jesus and are encouraged to follow him fearlessly. I really believe that God has something unique for us. You know, when Petey was telling me that I'm up this week, he's like, you know what, just preach what's on your heart. And I just feel like God put something on my heart that is exactly the right time for some of you who are here in the room or maybe you're watching online. So today, if you're taking notes, today's title of the message is called Unfair Advantage. Unfair Advantage. And it's going to sound one way at first, but you're going to see halfway through the message how it, it changes and the unfair advantage is actually in your favor. So, you know, this is pretty exciting about, you know, what, what God's going to challenge us to, to hear from Him is a message about faith. And I really believe, like, I can always be challenging my faith. How many of you would say, you know what, I could use some extra faith in some areas in my life right now? Is anybody else here? Yeah, I mean, that's us. That's all of us. We're always facing things that seem impossible to us. I remember years ago, we were still living in Louisiana, uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and our kids had just learned how to ride bikes. So my son's about five at the time. Brooklyn was probably 11 or so at the time. And, you know, they are like, you know, I was pretty excited that they were learning to ride bikes. So we just thought the natural next step was to go to the only hill in Baton Rouge because it's pretty flat. Let's go to the only hill and ride down this hill and let's just see how it goes on bikes. And it did not go well. We get up to the top of this hill and we're just like, okay, kids, let's ride down together. You guys go first for whatever reason and we'll watch you guys go. So they start riding down this hill and the speed is unbelievable. I could not believe how fast they picked up speed speed. They're flying down this hill. And I mean, just hitting every bump and uh, and Brooklyn goes about 25 yards and she just like falls over sideways, no brakes, falls over sideways, gets scraped up. You know, she's upset about that. But my son is just, he just keeps going and he's going so fast. He's going like 400 miles an hour down this hill and he's, and he's going straight to a grove of trees. So like he's headed to these trees and I'm looking at Brooklyn, I'm like, there's no way I can catch up with him. There's no way that we can reach him where he is. He's on his own right now. And that's whenever I looked at Brooke and I said, I taught them how to ride the bike. Why didn't you tell them about brakes? So he's flying down this hill and, and he's coming to this tree. And I'm thinking this is going to be the moment he's going to be seriously injured. I had like my heart just like dropped. And he gets up to the base of this tree and there's like a, lar- a large mulch patch around this tree and he hits it and it slows him down just enough to when he falls, his head is just inches from this tree. And I was so grateful for that moment, but I was blown away by the fact that that didn't have to happen. I mean, they they both had bicycles with brakes on them, and it's like they had never heard of brakes before. They didn't use what could have saved their lives. And I was just thinking about that this week because there are so many moments in our lives that we could be helped, but we don't have the right level of faith or belief in that thing to be helped. Because you don't use what you don't believe in. You you don't use what you don't believe in. And today, as I talk about faith, I'm I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching to myself as well because there are there's always gaps in our faith. Now, when if if you're someone who is visiting church for the first time, or you're not even sure what you believe about God, you're like, I don't have any faith. I don't have any belief. I understand, and I'm with you. And I still believe that this message can speak to you and can reach you right where you are. Because the truth is, whether you're atheist or a theist. Whatever your belief is about God, we all believe in something, right? We all have faith in something. This morning, you got up and you turned a light switch on and you had faith that your room was gonna be illuminated. You got in your vehicle and you turned the key or you pressed the button and you had faith that the engine would turn over or your electric motor would whirl to life and you would get here. You had faith when you sat down on that chair and none of you are sitting on the ground. Your chair is held up. Isn't that like the worst thing in the world though? If you sit on a chair and it doesn't hold up, it's like the most humiliating thing in the planet. But you all, we all live by faith every moment of our life, whether you believe in God or you don't, we all live with a level of faith. Now, the other thing that's true about all of humanity is that we are constantly facing impossible situations seemingly impossible, at least from our perspective. 
or you come up against something and there's a relational wall that you hit, there's a financial wall that you hit, there's a physical wall that you hit, and whatever it is, it looks like to your eyes and the best of your understanding that it is an impossible hurdle ahead of you. But just because it's impossible to you, it doesn't mean it's impossible. Because, because we can look at those impossible situations and you can either say that's a barrier or that's an opportunity. Because God, as part of the equation, changes the whole story, changes everything. So, so if you're taking notes, here's the first thing I want you to write down before we even jump into any scripture. What you believe determines what's possible. What we believe determines what is possible. So, so we, you know, we all live by some level of faith, but what I think is fascinating is that even believers in Jesus, those of us who follow Jesus, we follow the way of Jesus, he, is, he has transformed our lives and we would say, yes, I'm a Christian, I have faith. Sometimes that faith is only intellectual. It, it's, a, it's something we may even voice and it's something that we sing about and it's something that, that we would say, you know, it's in my heart, but it doesn't necessarily transform the way that I live. That is called practical atheism. Some of us are practical atheists. Even though we believe in God and we would say, yes, I believe, there's a gap in our faith. And all of us have experienced that on some level. Martin Luther King said this about practical atheism. He said that the most dangerous type of atheism is not theoretical atheism, but practical atheism. We say with our mouths that we believe in him, but we live with our lives like he never existed. Wow. I mean, could that be true of you and I? Could that be true that we would live lives of faith and we have the Christian t-shirt and we have, you know, we are here on the weekends and we're singing songs that, that are only head knowledge. They're not actually transformative. They're not actually changing the way that we live. I think it's super possible that that's the situation. We see a story actually, before I get into our main passage for today, you see a story about a man in the gospels that, his son is, is plagued by these attacks from these demons that are throwing him in fire and all of these things. And, and, and he comes to Jesus and he's like, Jesus, if you can heal him, would you please heal him? And Jesus says, what do you mean if? What do you mean if I can heal him? Don't you believe? Like, where's your faith? And the man says this, Mark 9, 24, the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. He's saying, I have a level of faith, but there's gaps in my faith. I believe, but I don't really believe. There's part of me that believes, but I know that I need some help here. And that would be my perspective coming into this message today that I pray for you is, yes, God, I believe, but I also understand and I'm going to confront the fact that there are some gaps in my belief. So help us, help me, God, to overcome my own belief. So what could that look like for you? Your, your belief or your faith is a little finicky. Mine is for sure. I'll be honest with you. Um, for instance, I find it very easy to pray for and have great faith for your needs. If any of you were to come to me and say, here's what I'm facing, it seems impossible for me. My response in a very authentic way will be, God can do it. I'll believe with you. I believe God can do it. Let's pray right now. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna believe that God can do it. Let's talk about scripture that can back that up and let's trust God together. But when it comes to my own life, I've got some gaps. Because, man, when Petey preached a few weeks ago that God doesn't just love me, but he likes me, that wrecked me. Because that, and that even affects my faith some. Because sometimes I find myself up, up against impossible situations and I think maybe I deserve to be here. Maybe God's upset with me. Maybe he's trying to teach me something, which could be the case. But my default is always, maybe God doesn't want me to have that. Instead of, what if God did it? So, so I've got gaps in my faith. Uh, maybe maybe for, for you, it could be like, you know what? I believe God for the financial, but I don't know if he can do it in my physical body. Or maybe you believe, you know what? I, he can do it in my physical body, but I don't know if he can fix that broken relationship. So we all have got gaps, we've all got leanings where we're like, you know what, I believe somewhat, but I don't fully believe. So, so we need to look at those and be like, you know what, God, I understand, I've got some gaps and I need your help. And here's what God does, when you live a life of faith, it gives you leverage in the situation. A few years ago, I was fishing with some friends and we had a large 
fishing boat, which it had like a 225 horsepower engine, which I'm not sure how that translates to boats because horses don't swim that fast. But anyway, it's, it's a powerful boat. So we're out there and we get stuck on this sandbar and, and, and we can't go anywhere. And they, they're just flooring that engine and it's not going anywhere. So I, I, you know, the water's pretty shallow. So I get out of the boat, I stand on the sandbar and I just pick up the boat. It's buoyant enough for me to lift up the back of it because it was teetering on the sandbar just right. And I lifted up the corner and the engine was able to get off of the sandbar. And I was thinking about that this week, that that's exactly what God wants to do in us. Sometimes we rely on our own strength and our own power and we're like, we're giving it everything we have, but we can't get, we're stuck. You're up against the impossible and he's like, I want to leverage your life. I wanna give you something that you cannot get on your own. And when you live a life of faith, you invite me in to do what only I can do to give you a supernatural leverage. Because how do we say that we're Christians? How do we say that we believe in God and we live such a natural life? We're practical atheists in so many ways, but we are called to live with supernatural faith, understanding that it's God plus me. It's not, it's not me and God's watching, but it's God, you and I together are partnering in this life, and I cannot do this on my own. When I face the impossible, it's not like, it's not like God's like, okay, impress me. Let's see what you can do. God's like, hey, look, this thing's in front of you. Obviously, it's no problem. Let's do this with faith, and I'm going to give you the leverage to handle this situation. We're gonna look at a crazy leverage story in 1 Samuel 14. And when, what I love about this story is like if some Bibles have like, it's kind of like a, um, a descriptor of the story that's coming up. And in my Bible, it says in the New Living Translation, it calls this story, Jonathan's daring plan. And I love that because it sets up the heart position of this young man named Jonathan. It says in verse one, one day Jonathan, and, and let me just set the story for you. Jonathan is King Saul's son, so he's a prince. He's a friend of David. Um, and at the time, um, the, the enemy of Israel was against them, and they were coming, and they were attacking them, and they wanted to do everything they could to destroy God's people, Israel. And these people were called the Philistines. So, so Jonathan sees this. He sees it as, it's an injustice, and he wants to do something about it. In verse 1, one day Jonathan says to his armor bearer, which as a prince you would have someone who would carry your sword and spear and, you know, shield around. So he says to his armor bearer, come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. He's kind of breaking the rules here. He's not supposed to do that. He's supposed to follow military protocol, but Jonathan's like, this is wrong and I've got to do something about it now. So in verse four, it says, to reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go down between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and Sine. The cliff on the north was in front of Michmash and the one on the south was in front of Geba. And you wonder sometimes, why does a Bible have details like this in it? Here's why. This actually gives us the exact location of where this was. This was called the Great ravine of Suenet. It was three miles long between two jagged points. It actually had a name in Hebrew and it was called the teeth of the cliff. So imagine an extremely jagged cliff that you may see somewhere around here and imagine you're having to climb down that and then climb back up to get to the enemy. It says, Jonathan tells his armor bearer, let's go across to the outpost of those pagans. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, perhaps the Lord will help us for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. And what's crazy about this is actually there weren't even a few warriors. There was literally two. There was Jonathan and his armor bearer. And he leads with such faith. And his armor bearer re responds, do what you think is best. The armor bearer replied, I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Now, you think about this story, this is insane that they would even think about doing this. And at first glance, it might be like, are these two like 18-year-old boys? Like, how stupid is this plan, you know? Like doing the worst thing you could think of. And even though on the surface, that's what it looks like, I really believe that this is so much more than that. These are young men, yeah, but they're not driven by stupidity. They're driven by faith. They're driven by justice and God's design and plan for Israel. And they're like, this is not God's plan. And even though it seems impossible, if God's in it, it's possible. 
And so, so you follow these guys, and it's kind of like, man, this is so weird. And I, I love that Jonathan has great faith, and his armor bearer is just like, yeah, okay, let's do it. Yeah. Do you have somebody in your life like that? Brooke and I went to Telluride this last week. We went camping to see the fall colors and stuff. And one of the days we were there, we decided to drive. I've got, I've got a four-wheel drive truck, and we decided let's drive what's called Imogene Pass. Have any of you heard of this, this pass? A few of you, yeah. Um, if you've done it, I'm sure you've done it better than I did it because I was not ready for it. Uh, I'll be honest with you, my truck barely made it. We struggled It's 17 miles, mountain pass, rocks and steep. I mean, one lane, it was, it was pretty hair raising. I don't get nervous very often and I was pretty nervous. So uh, it, was, it was pretty scary at times. We're, but we're driving up and this is one of the areas that you have to drive up this road that's on in this area. And this is just one of the many like steep spots. And I remember there's spots that you're driving up and my truck is like slipping. So it's, so it's going up and then it slips and then it grabs and it slips and it grabs and it slips and it goes up. And, and if I had better equipment, it may have gone better. But I will tell you, um, Brooke and I were looking at each other and we were kind of like, we probably should have told the kids goodbye for the last time. You know, like it was pretty nerve wracking for a little while there. But what I noticed is, is as, as my truck was going up and car people are going to I think I sound like an idiot right now, but, but the way four-wheel drive works is, is when the front axle needs help, the rear axle begins to get more power and spin. When the rear axle needs help, that front can get more power and begin to spin more. And it's kind of like each, each wheel or each wheel base will help each other along the way. When one's lacking in faith, the other has it. And I wonder, do you have somebody in your life that when you're lacking in faith, they say, whatever you decide, I'm with you completely. I'm with you. I believe with you. And, and not, only, not only in the moments when you have faith, they have faith, but in the moments when you don't have faith, they have faith. Because there's going to be moments in your life where you're going to see the impossible. And if you're alone, this is why groups are so important. This is why connecting with people and not coming in on Sundays and, hi, how you doing? I'm doing great. See you later. And not having someone in your life this is why this matters. Because you need people to help build your faith in those impossible times. So God's about to do something crazy through these guys and they lead with this impossibility mindset. Yeah, God might do it. What if God does it? Wouldn't that be cool if God did it? All right, I've got a family text with, with my siblings and my parents and there's a lot of us. I have four siblings and we've got so many. My parents have a lot of grandkids now. But when there's things going on in our lives, we'll put in there, can you pray for this? Can you pray for this? Can you believe God for this? And just constantly in the next few minutes, it comes in, I'm praying for you. We're praying for you. We're believing for you. And that's the kind of relationships that you need. Why does it matter? Why does faith matter? Why does, it why does it matter that we live lives of faith? Number one, the Bible says actually in the book of Hebrews that it's impossible to please God without faith. Can't do it. God's not impressed with you. He's not impressed with your ability. He's not, wow, maybe I should invite them to be a part of the divine team one day. They're so great. He, no, he's like, he's impressed with faith. So when we live lives of faith, it's literally worship to God. When you, act, when you live a life that is activated by faith, you're worshiping God. The next thing is, if you don't live a life of faith, you're on your own and you never give God a chance to leverage that situation for ultimately his glory, but also for your good. And you end up struggling and spinning your wheels for no reason. And God's trying to say, I want to partner with you. I just want you to believe in me. I just want you to have faith in me. I just want you to trust me. So, so this is what happens. They've got this crazy faith. Verse eight, armor bearer says, whatever you want to do, let's do it. Jonathan says, all right then. We will cross over and let them see us. These guys are not very smart. This is not a good military strategy. Let's cross over and let them see us. It's like, you know, in the action movies when they're like, they could just take someone out, but they're like, hey, and get them to turn around. I'm like, just take them out. And these guys were like, they're like, let's let them see us. Let's let them count the cards and know exactly what we're up to. Let's let them see us. If they say to us, stay where you are or we'll kill you, then we'll stop and not go up to them. <laughs> oh, man. But if they say, this is even worse, if they say, come on up and fight, then we'll go up. That will be the Lord's sign that he will help us defeat them. What a weird theology. That is, I, I, I would not recommend any of this. 
Then the men from the outpost, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, verse 11, when the Philistines saw them coming, they shouted, look, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes. Then the men from the outpost shouted to Jonathan, come on up here and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan responds to that, all the Philistines saying, we're going to kill you when you get up here as, come on, climb up right behind me, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, for the Lord will help us defeat them if they say, come on up. This, this kind of thinking, it blows my mind. And I don't recommend, like, this is kind of strange. You know, it's, it's kind of like saying, God, if you want me to take this job at 4 p.m. today, I want to look up in the sky and I want to see a cloud shaped like a bunny rabbit. And I want that bunny rabbit to be chased by a coyote, which then gets eaten by a large truck. Can you do that, God? Because they don't know it's you. And we do weird stuff like that with God, right? To, mostly like to get out of stuff because we're like, that's never going to happen. And Jonathan's like, hey, if this really weird thing happens, we're going to know God's in it. And I just think for me, when I look at this, at first it looks, yeah, it looks foolish. But what I really see at the heart, at the heart and the core of Jonathan and his armor bearer is a lean towards bravery. Instead of a lean towards fear, instead of a, God's probably not in that, we should stay away from that, it seems too impossible, let's just get a new diagnosis, let's just get, you know, something, let's just get a better job, let's just do whatever, like we've got all these natural fixes, and not that those things are bad, but I think that the lean that we have in our life, if you lean towards bravery, like what if God did something here? What if God blessed my giving? What if God wanted to answer this prayer for healing? What if God wanted to restore this relationship that I've been running from for all these years? What if God could be in that? That's a bravery lean. That's a perspective that, you know what? It seems impossible and I have no idea how to fix it. But if I link arms with God, I believe there's a supernatural leverage that's going to change some stuff in my life. And when you live that way, things begin to change. And, you know, I told you a story about my kids running down that hill and flying down that hill on their bikes and getting, you know, almost seriously injured. You know what's crazy about today? My kids ride bikes today because they lean with bravery. They don't lean with, oh, but you remember that last time that that happened? And remember whenever we prayed for that, it didn't work. Remember whenever I trusted God that last time and it didn't happen, so I can't do that anymore. Instead of that fearful mindset, it's a bravery mindset that I'm going to lead with what if God does what I can't imagine could be done? What if God does the impossible in this situation? Here's the next thing I want you to write down if you're taking notes. With God, disadvantage becomes advantage. With God, disadvantage becomes advantage. And this is where the title of the message, Unfair Advantage, kind of takes a turn as well. Because it looks impossible for these two. And, and I'm just imagining as I'm reading this story, I, I, I hiked up the Mount Hermon scramble side in, in Monument a few weeks ago. And there's like an easy side you can drive most of the way and then, and then hike a pretty nice hike on the way up. But then there's like an insane side where you just go up the front. And, and I did that a few weeks ago. I've always wanted to do it. And it kicked my butt, honestly. But, but I'm going up and I'm on hands and knees and I'm crawling up these rocks to get up there. Every 200 feet, I'm stopping and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm so out of shape. I need some help here. And I finally get up and I was just like not ready to do anything else. I get up and I'm like, I'm just gonna take a nap for a while. That's how I felt. And you're gonna see in the story, that's kind of not how it goes at all. It's pretty wild. But in those moments, you just think like on your way up, when you're coming from a low place and you're giving everything you have just to get up there, that is not an advantage in the natural. It does not make sense to do that. You are spent by the time that that happens. And, and in those moments, you realize the disadvantages that you have. I am human. I am weak. I am not able to complete this task in this moment. And there's a lot of moments in your life that you're going to face things like that. And you're going to realize, you know what, I'm actually at a disadvantage here. What, what I'm facing financially, what I'm facing relationally, what I'm facing, you know, with these temptations, with this, this struggle that I'm in, in, I am not in an advantage here. I am at a disadvantage. And God loves to work in disadvantage because it forces you to let him do what he can do. 
Because you cannot take the credit, you cannot look back at your life and be like, that was me, I did it all. God wants us to live lives when you look back at it, you're kind of like, I don't actually know how that happened. I got here, but I cannot take credit for it. Because I know for sure, and I can tell you again and again, that God did that, and he did that, and he did that. It wasn't me. It was God. God is the one who did it. So embrace the disadvantages that you may find yourselves, you know, being stressed about. One of the disadvantages that I find myself in pretty often is every time I get up to preach or communicate God's word in any way, I think about the fact that I never went to Bible college. I got married very young, jumped into the workforce, and then we felt God's calling on our life to go into ministry. And it's like, we're already doing something here. We're already like, we've got momentum, we've got responsibilities, we've got bills, we've got, how, how do we do that? I can't like go to college now and learn how to communicate. And I just felt God saying, is that gonna be the excuse? Is that what we're gonna do? That we're gonna say to stop you? And I just felt like God was saying to me, you know what, this may be a disadvantage, but it's an opportunity for you to lean into me more than you probably would have. So I became a student of the word and I just began to study the word and study preachers and learn how to do this thing that I felt like God was calling me to do and sucked at it for quite a while. But I felt like God just kept growing me and growing me and Paul tells young Timothy to study, to show yourself approved that there was a work associated with it that I'm gonna give it everything I have and trust that God is gonna meet me. So whenever I honestly, if you've ever been in a small group situation with me, I'm not very good in small group situations. I'm not very good at, at explaining the word or just kind of fumble a lot more. But when I stand on a, on a stage or get in a place where I preach the word of God, the spiritual gift that I feel like God's put in me, it's like he helps me in a way that I can't help myself. There's a supernatural leverage to me trusting him with that disadvantage. And he wants to do the same exact thing in your life. Whatever your disadvantage may seem, God wants to say, I want to leverage that disadvantage so that you don't get the credit and people will see me as a miracle worker. And they would see, you know what? I don't know how in the world that happened, but it happened. God did a thing there. And God wants to do that just like he did it in Jonathan and his armor bearer's life. So Verse 13, this is where it gets crazy. Not that it hasn't already been crazy, but it gets crazier. Verse 13, so they climbed up this ravine using both hands and feet. And as they're climbing up, okay, the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed those who came behind them. I get this real like princess bride vibe where like they're coming up, you know, and the enemy's just like waiting. Okay, come on up. And then all of a sudden, they surprised the enemy, and on their way up, they began slaying the enemy forces. They're, they're, the Philistines are falling before them. In verse 14, they killed some 20 men in all, and their bodies were scattered over about a half an acre. So this is wild. Two men are killing 10 times their, you know, they're 10 times them each. And this is crazy, like they just keep wiping out these guys. Now still, 20 people is not that much. I mean, this is, a, this is a big task ahead of them. But suddenly, God begins to do a thing. Panic broke out in the Philistine army, both in the camp and in the field. They're, they don't know what's going on, but a supernatural leverage thing is happening, including even the outposts and raiding parties. And just then, an earthquake struck and everyone was terrified. And if you continue in the story, you see Jonathan and his armor bearer begin to get victory in this. It's insane what happens because their faith is met with God's ability. And this supernatural leverage thing happens and the impossible, the impossible happens before their very eyes. And you read this story and you're like, God, this is insane. And I wanna have faith that you would do those kinds of things in my life. And I need to stop right here. Because I understand that there are some of you that you do live lives of faith. You are obedient in your faith and you have believed God for the impossible. And there's no gaps in your belief. And you still haven't seen it. And I understand that. And I don't have an answer for it. I don't know why. I think you will know why eventually. 
And God's up to all kinds of things that we can't calculate and we can't figure out. So I'm not giving you a formula. It's not math. But I'm just telling you that when you live a life of faith and you trust God for the impossible is the only way that God has the access to your life. That God can be given the permission to do something. There's a partnership here. He's not just moving pawns around, but he's asking to partner with us in our life. And you think about this. I mean, Jonathan, you know, he, he had this great bold statement that he made. Let's go up and see what happens. But honestly, God was in even the tiniest things in this story. God was actually the one who had given the breath to Jonathan's lungs and the strength to climb the ravine and his armor bearer, the strength to hold the weapons, all of it. God was in all of it. And sometimes we think God's only in the big things, but God's in the small things too. And if you realize that God's been in the small things, it gives you faith for the bigger things. But we miss that sometimes, right? And we're kind of just like, well, this is just what happens. And it's not what happens. God did it. God did a little miracle so that you could have faith for the next size and the next size and the next size. I remember when I was a kid that when I first learned that I could trust God with the impossible, I was around 10 years old, I'd I'd say, and I must have been playing with frogs a lot because I had warts all over my hands, if that's a real thing. And I remember thinking, you know what, I don't, I don't care about girls right now, but there's going to be a day when I do, and this is probably going to be a problem. Don't want warts all over. So I remember just telling my mom, what do I do about these? And we tried everything. And she's like, why don't you just pray? Just ask God about the warts. So I remember praying in this super simple 10-year-old prayer, God, would you take the warts away? And the next morning I woke up, and there's no warts. There's no scars. They're just gone. And I will never forget seeing my skin clean. And they're just, they're just gone. In third grade, I, uh, I broke my elbow on a trampoline. I had to get pins in it. And it was a bad enough break to where I had nerve damage. I couldn't feel anything in my arm. Couldn't move my hand. I had no function. And I remember my mom and dad going to our church and just saying, hey, would we pray for Josh? Can we just put this on the prayer list? And our church began to pray for my arm. And the same exact thing, I woke up one morning and I run into the kitchen, mom, still in a cast, but I can move my hand. I've got movement. God did a miracle in my hand again. And I just remember those little moments, those little things. God did a little thing to give me faith for the next thing. And just start with the wart. (laughs) Start with the small thing. Trust God for what seems like a small thing. And it's not always going to be a physical thing. And God may for whatever reason, his, in his perfect plan, he may have a reason for the ailment, the thorn in your side. I don't know. But I know you're supposed to pray. I know you're supposed to believe. And, and, and it, might be, it might be a financial thing that you're really facing. You're like, I cannot see a way out of this. I don't know how God's going to do it, but I believe he can. And the relational thing that you're just like, there's no way. I'm in the right, they're in the wrong. There's no way this is ever, they're never going to come to me. Or maybe you're on the opposite side. There's no way I'm ever going to forgive them. God can do it. It might seem impossible, but God can transform the heart of any man. So you might be looking at whatever the impossible thing is that you're looking at today. It may seem impossible, but if you're available with your faith, here's the last thing I want you to write, write down if you're taking notes. God loans advantage to the available. God loans advantage to the available. I didn't say God loans advantage to the able. I said God loans advantage to the available. So don't trust in your own strength. The last thing I want in my life is to look back at my life, to look back at the good things that happened in my life and say, wow, I really killed it. I really did a good job. I really did all of it on my own. Aren't you pleased with me? Aren't you happy with me? I don't want to live a life where I get the credit because when you do things to start getting the credit, you've got to keep doing those things to continue to advance your life. But if you live the earliest you can start off in your faith following Jesus, the earliest you can start by saying, God, I don't know what to do. 
and I don't think I can handle it, so I'm going to ask you, please come and do something in this situation. The earliest you can include them in your life, the more you'll see your life is trailed with miraculous things again and again. And you don't have to know how to explain them. All you have to know is how to say, but God. But God, there's no way. I can't explain it, but I know that God's in it. I know that God is faithful. I know that God's going to continue to do it. And you know, I, I just hope, I hope today that like you're challenged to like live a life of faith and I'm gonna give you a chance to like believe God for your impossible thing in a second. But honestly, the transition and the most important thing that, that you have to hear is this. This is actually, the Bible is full of, especially in the Old Testament, it's full of what's called types and shadows of Jesus. So it's like a precursor. It's, a, it's an example of the characteristic of Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus actually did something very similar to what Jonathan did so that you could have freedom, so that you could be saved, so that the enemy would be stopped at your feet. The Bible says that Jesus, even though he was a perfect son of God in Philippians 2, 6, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. What Jesus did is he gave up his safety in heaven, his divine privileges in heaven, and he went down into the ravine of earth, of sin for you. The Bible says that he took on the shame and the sin of every human. And, and, and it's what's wild to me is he kind of even had the same perspective as Jonathan because the Bible says that not only did Jesus die for those who were believers right now, as Paul's writing to the church, he says, actually, Jesus died for everyone, even those who would never say yes, even those who would spit in his face and say, I don't need you in my life because Jesus had a perhaps they will say yes mindset. Jesus had faith when he went to the cross. And Jesus gives you an opportunity today. I really believe that God is every week, every moment that we have to hear the gospel, it's like heaven's just waiting. Is today going to be the day? Is October 8th going to be the day that they say yes? God knows that today is your day. But if you listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit, 